All right, let's lift the cloche. I mean, Ebers did tell me earlier that he is in a vintage year, so you're already thinking in the past. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I'm going to take it as a compliment. You like grapes. Some of us, we, yeah, we get finer with age. <laughs> lift it. Oh. Okay. It's a Meccano set from 100 years ago. I like it, it's mechanical. Are we gonna get lead poisoning from Cogs. eating from it? Oh my goodness, it's still got, where, whose ever garage it's been kept in, it's still got all of the dust from the rug. Thanks mate. Right, today we are asking a chef and a normal home cook to review some antique gadgets. Some of them may be as old as Ben. Okay, right, well it's a whisk. Right, it's, it's the very first. KitchenAid, perhaps, or Kenwood stand mixer. You just clip this on here, I think. Clip it in, tighten it up on this end, add your crank, put the safety nozzle on. We've got a dough hook attachment, Ebers. And we've got everything. This one's a whisk, we could do egg whites. It's a hand cranked whisk. It's a stand mixer before the need to plug it in. Boys, this is the Landers, Frary and Clark Universal Cake Maker. So cake as we know it now was popularised in the 19th century uh, and with the appetite for cake came the need for cake makers. Absolutely. Uh, this is the 1896 version of the modern happy, stand mixer. And you simply select your required attachment, you've got a whisk, you've got a dough hook, you add your ingredients and you crank the handle to mix. Straight off the bat, it's really smooth and satisfying to use. And what is cool is because of the different, obviously the different cogs, the whisks turn, obviously, at different points. So they are almost counter-spinning on each other. You know the teacups ride at the fairground? Yeah. It's doing that. It's, it's exactly individually that. spinning and spinning round. So the company was based in Connecticut, USA, uh, and although this model is about 130 years old, the company actually began in 1862, created all sorts of different homewares, and as electricity became more popular, they adapted, they started making electric versions as well. So kind of in, in it for the long run. So what we do have are some ingredients to bake a cake. Oh, I don't think this is food grade safe, <laughs> FYI. So everything's all weighed out for you, and what we'd like you to do is just simply make a tray bake cake. Soft butter. Room temperature butter. So we're going equal flour, equal sugar, equal butter, equal now, eggs. You hold, I'll crank. Is that what we agreed? Yeah. It's definitely creaming. It's a shame that our table width is too thick because I'd really like to test. Well, if you clamp it. Because you are having to put in a fair bit of effort. I'm having to put in a fair bit of effort. Right, gonna add in one egg at a time. Keep cranking. So obviously nowadays we'd compare this to an electric stand mixer, which we're very used to using, which does all of the effort and takes all of the effort away from you. I suppose in the 19th century, what we'd be looking at is doing this in a bowl with a spoon. Yeah, I'll be yeah. honest, I still make most of my cakes that way because they're generally in smaller volume, but actually by the time you've dirtied a stand mixer, got it out, plugged it in, dirtied, you've actually just got the job done. Oh, he's standing up, everyone, he means business. Now it's a stand mixer. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Teaspoon of flour in with each egg. There we go. Boom. Batter. I would say cake made. It reminds me of the apple peeler and those old ancient ones of those. And again, it's just so satisfying to watch cogs move. And I think we've all got this innate love of proper engineering. That mechanics. And when you see it working, you think, God, why yeah. did we have to make everything electrical? Gersh, can you put this in the oven for baby and me? Yeah. I'm baby. <laughs> 20 minutes later, we have, we a, have a cake. cake. We've got a sponge. We've got a sponge. I wouldn't call it a cake. It's I mean, a good it's sponge. buttery. It's like a pound cake. If we're talking, you know, American state designed, it's basically pound cake, right? So this is the Landers, Frary and Clark Universal Cake Maker. Now we paid 63 pounds and 25 pence for this. To be honest, price is a bit irrelevant because nobody is buying this for its original purpose to use in its original way. It's always going to be a collector's item, a slice of history. I think the fact that it's still around uh, 130 years after it was first made. Yeah, it's, it's not been dented at all. The universal cake maker, is it built to last or should it just stay in the past? Well, it's definitely built to last. It's robust, it works really well. Nothing wrong with it. 
it absolutely does a job in helping you make a cake. Technology has advanced, making that process easier, but it wasn't exactly difficult, was it? No, but also just like any bowl with one of those hand crank whisks, it does exactly the same thing. Like there's other ways of doing it. It is built to last though. Built to last. What's amazing is that the method that it uses to do it hasn't changed. We figured out how to whisk best and if that it hasn't broke, moved on. Don't fix it. Lovely. Off to a great start, boys. Just make it dishwasher proof. <laughs> <laughs> on to the next one. Give the cloche a lift. Much smaller. I know what oh, this is. Oh, it's spring loaded. Okay. You yeah. pop your garlic in there. The clamp pushes the garlic into the grater. You move it back and forth and you grate garlic with it. I think that, except not for garlic, because I think this is a rasper. So I think you would use this side of a box grater for sometimes hard cheese or something firm and harder like mace. Nutmeg. Nutmeg. Yes. This is a spice grinder or nutmeg grinder. It's spring loaded for your nut <laughs> and then you make it. Yeah, this is a nutmeg or spice grinder. So it's got a spring loaded hopper. This is what the words say. The spring loaded hopper allows the user to grind hard spices such as nutmeg with ease. Great. So this, again, dates back to the 1890s. Uh, it was designed by George H. Thomas in Massachusetts. So this was patented in 1891, which was the same year that Thomas died. And it went on sale the following year. So like oh, many so he didn't artists, see he didn't get to he didn't see, get the, to see his, his own success. Well, let's celebrate it right now. Hup. So a spring-loaded hopper. Boop. I mean, as amazing as it is watching you Great nutmeg onto yeah, should we have a plate? Top. Would you like yeah, please? Maybe some rice pudding. Oh, okay. I don't know if the spring has lost its sprung because it's not applying enough pressure to the grater to actually have much work. So I don't know if you're also supposed to push at the same time. In which I'm just trying to work out how yeah. you hold it. Hold it upright. Uh, yeah, that way. So that yeah. gravity is also doing a, a job. Yeah, it's working. But yeah, I know what you mean. Maybe. I mean, it's also valid that, that, that maybe the, the actual rasp has softened over a hundred odd years. Yeah, can I have a go? But it is, I mean, it is doing a job. I just think the, sp the spring could be more sprung. Yeah, well, that's it. Now we're working. Okay, we found a get around. Well, it, uh, do you know what? It's working and it's very, very fine. That wonderful smell of almost nauseating nutmeg. So nutmeg was incredibly popular in the 18th and 19th centuries. It had a real value to it. We have grated. There we go. Delicious. Nutmeg is great. I should use it more. Nutmeg is one of those spices where it's quite subtle and therefore benefits from sugar, yes, but anything that's creamy yeah, or eggy. Yeah. So it's great in custards, egg custard tarts. So the nutmeg spice grinder originally sold for 25 cents. We paid 27 pounds and eight pence. That is a wonderful slice of history that mm. I think, to be honest with you, would hang nicer in a farmhouse kitchen than it would be useful on a regular basis. It'll make, it'll make a good prop, wouldn't it? A good set dressing prop. Yeah. So, is it built to last, or is it best kept in the past? I mean, it works. It does the job, it's built to last. Yeah. What I think it might have outlasted is the popularity of nutmeg. We don't use nutmeg enough in our cooking Until for this now. anymore. And the, the multiples of millions of people who are gonna see this video now. We're going to start the nutmeg revolution. Yeah, I'm going to start. If everyone who nutmeg. watched this video went out and bought a single nutmeg, the UK would sell out. That'd be 47 nutmegs. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the next one. One second spaff, which was also his nickname at university. It is just four weeks until our washed up live weekend show. You've helped us put together a spectacular lineup of teen challenges, laugh out loud trials, chefy masterclasses, and mouth watering food for us all to enjoy at our beachside filming location live on the weekend of the 29th and 30th of June. We've taken on your feedback from previous live shows to put together our most fun, collaborative and foodie live show ever across 12 plus hours of TV quality live streamed content, all with a desert island twist. Find out all about it using the QR code or the link below. Submit your ideas using the survey link and you can grab your tickets now to join us for two days of entertainment, great food and laughs together. As, let's face it, 
the greatest community on all of YouTube. Ready for another? Absolutely, Ebers, it's your lift. Can't wait. Looks angry. It does oh. look angry. I think I know what it is. It's the really annoying, difficult to use attachment on a Swiss Army knife that's supposed to get you into tins. A can opener. Okay, interesting, so, I like this. So this can opener is said to date back to the 1870s. So the canning process, obviously built to help preserve foods, particularly foods with a short shelf life. A short Such shelf life. Short shelf life. It's a really hard phrase to say. Yeah. Uh, meats and things like that. So the canning process made that possible, but people needed a way of being able to get into the cans when they had them at home. And this was the tool that was developed to help them do it. And it's one of my um, most interesting, and I have many interesting, uh, sort of pub quiz trivia that the tin opener was developed many, many years after the tin. Because originally it was for army rations and all soldiers would have something in their a pocket knife. that would kind of do the job. The actual domestic tin opener was years after the tin. There you go. Do you want to try and open the tin? Yeah. Yes, please. The method is you use the lower blade to pierce the tin and lever the tin open whilst using the upper blade for leverage on the thicker rim of the can. Nice working. Everything we read about this said this does not open tins in a similar way to how we open them now. No, this now does we leave a lot of sharp, jagged edges. Oh, we got lucky, Mike. We can have this with our rice pudding. What is it? Tinned peaches. Oh, great! That, my friend, works. Works. But look at the look at the lid of that tin. I mean, yes. Yeah. And there's possibly like a few bits of shrapnel in the food, but I think on the whole. As a rudimentary device, it works. It's a tin opener, So it's opened a tin. Don't have to worry about the sharp edges because they've given you... There you go. So you're not putting your fingers anywhere near it. Yeah. So in the mid to late 1800s, there are a lot of different designs for can openers uh, as people try to work out domestically what's the best and the safest way of opening the tins. The eBay ad for this one says that one like this is featured in the Aberdeen University Museum which belonged to the crew of a British Arctic expedition of 1875 to 1876. So exactly the same as that was taken on an Arctic exploration expedition. Mm. Stab. Uh, Mike's probably using it the proper way. So you found a couple of different ways of doing it. I think Mike's way might be the traditional way where the other end is for piercing it to be able to pour liquid out. And the initial stab. Yeah. Both methods required quite a lot of effort considering how we open tins now. Um, so I think that evolution in technology has definitely been worthwhile because that was an effort. Uh, it's interesting because we've got the ring pull now, which is on like, I would say 50% of tins. I've made that number up. In the but UK, it was closer to 90 up until COVID and then it dropped right back down because the cost of a ring pull is slightly more. And when the food cost was an issue and food inflation, Manufacturers were finding every opportunity to cut costs and a can without a ring pull was a fraction of a penny less. So they moved back to that when you're doing a million cans, it adds up. How much do you think we paid for the antique can? Has this one been to the Arctic? I can neither confirm nor deny if that one's been to the Arctic, but it is the same as the one that definitely did go to it the Arctic. It might have been to the Outer Hebrides and that's cold. <laughs> £30. We spent £9.59. Really well built, really well made. It does the job. I think technology has moved us further on and I'm grateful for that. So, is it built to last or should it be kept in the past? There is nothing wrong with it. There is nothing broken with it. It's still operational, but I feel like it should be left in the past because now we've got the ring pool. I agree. Lovely. Room for one more. 100%. I like the ones where we're not allowed to turn around whilst they put the cloche Do on you it. think that means it doesn't fit under the cloche? I'm, I'm going to assume so. Can we turn? Turn around and lift the cloche. Oh, mate, already. Oh, this my word. Great. It looks like some kind of tombola. <laughs> there's, a, there's a handle. Oh. So okay, it rotates one way. We've specifically asked you not to read the front because it will give it away straight away. So there's brushes on the inside of this side, Ebers. Have you got a hole in your side? Yeah. Oh. 
Is it, is it like a knife cleaner? Mike has absolutely nailed it on the head. This is the Tower Knife Cleaner. Oh, knife hey! Cleaner. Not only that, this is the improved Tower Knife Cleaner. This item was designed to make one of the most dull kitchen tasks a little easier, cleaning knives. As the handle is turned, an abrasive is swept across the knives to polish the blades and handles. So this was used to clean knives that have been over open fires and things like that. They're sooty, they're really dirty, they need a lot of cleaning um, and have been against sort of abrasive materials, they need that kind of sharpening. We don't have any knives like that in the studio. So Ed and Kush ruined some of our knives and oh. really dirtied them up. Would you like to try and make them cleaner? Yeah. So whilst the machine cleans and polishes the knives, there is a powder that you use called emery powder, which is great as an abrasive material to also help sharpen as well. Ooh. Emery. Here's your knife. Oh my gosh! That has been over a hearth or two, hasn't it? Let's read the instructions. Fix the machine by screws to a table, stand or dresser in a dry place. If the high stand machine, fix it to the floor. The index must point upwards to the dot, except for carving knives where the index must point to the carvery hole. There. Boom. Don't start with the jerk. Give it a few turns and then push it all the way in. There we go. Oh, here we go. One, two, three, four, five. It does also say this six, should be nailed to a table or workshop. Seven, We're eight, going to do that. nine, Ten. Let's call it ten. Are we ready, everyone? I tell you what! It's done a good job there. Can I put my hands in? Yeah. What? Where? <laughs> I don't know, but my hands are now dirtier than the knife. <laughs> <laughs> so these types of knife cleaners date back to the 1860s. Uh, this one was invented by a guy called George Kent. Uh, he was actually uh, a window blind maker. Uh, uh, but this became his most prominent piece of work. This is so much fun! Okay, I've got the knife in a little bit further. I tell oh, you what, guys, it's that doing is a working. Good polish. It's doing a good polish. So one of the things this was used for was regularly cleaning and polishing cutlery ahead of dinner parties. That does make more sense because that way these will go in these ones quite nicely. <laughs> I pushed it really far in. Uh, once you get the hang of it, you can get it right in. My favourite thing is that these types of antique gadgets have lasted a hundred plus years, and they come into the sort of studio for ten minutes and we're pushing them to their extremes and possibly... I mean, for them. as far as the knife will physically go in... What's amazing is it's quite warm. There's so much friction going on in there that the knife is now warm. So you've got the emery powder, which gets added to the inside, and I suppose it's a little bit like dishwasher salt. You don't have to add it every time. But that's essentially a powdered version of a dark granular rock. It's incredibly abrasive. It's going to help to clean, polish, maybe even sharpen the knives with the abrasion. We kind of didn't really even follow the instructions because the knife had quite a considerable amount of, amount of fatty abrasion on it and it's, it's absolutely cleaned it. What would we use today that would do a similar job? I would say like the cake maker, we now have an automated version. We have a dishwasher rather than a stand mixer. Also, for this, got, we've got washing powders and things like that, which have advanced in technology. But the counter as well. that is sometimes you just still need to polish, and we go back to elbow grease. So our version is a slightly later version than the originals. As I said, it's the improved version. Um, but the original one came in eight different sizes and ranged from three pounds and eighteen shillings to four pounds and fourteen shillings. I would say that that's a fair amount. Yeah. Like if we if we think that you know at a similar time we were getting the smaller gadgets for twenty five cents, but I would have thought four to spend that's four a, pounds on something would have been a serious investment. Quite a hefty purchase. And if purchase. you're polishing knives and cutlery for functions, I think this probably puts you at the higher end of the middle classes. So yeah, is this uh, a pro kitchen gadget, a pro kitchen antique gadget. This is for the manor. This is for the estate, and this is for those who have uh, staff, I would suggest, as opposed to the first three that we looked at were, were more domestic. So we paid £195, I and I why. do think it's a museum piece. Yeah, I think it belongs in a museum. If you own a museum that would be interested in this... Let us know. You, you can, can have, have it. it. Yeah, <laughs> Because 100%. we don't need it anymore, because times have moved on. We'll need to but find a, a home for it. I think but that's... it is a, yeah. 
But as it's been featured on one of the most prominent cooking channels on YouTube now, it we'll give it to you 196 quid. It would be a premium. Got even more history. <laughs> Well, boys, the new and improved tower knife cleaner, is it built to last or should it have been kept in the past? It's built to last and it's fascinating. And it, this is a real insight into the cooking style, function style of that time, which has definitely moved on as a museum piece and a, a look into history. 100% built to last. It's great. Built to last and I really hope it lasts for another few hundred years in somebody's safe museum. Lovely. Well, over to you in the comments. <laughs> Comment down below, let us know which of these was most interesting to you and what antique kitchen gadgets should we be testing next? <laughs>